Welcome to part three of our midweek Lenten series. This is the night that the Lord has made. Our call to worship is from Psalm 27. Our first hymn is number 837, Lift High the Cross. We'll read Amos chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, and you could read a few more verses. They go together. Gospel reading from John chapter 12, verses 27 to 36. And then our hymn, Renew Me, O Eternal Light, uh, number 704 in Lutheran Service Book. And our closing hymn is, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light, hymn number 411. Grace to you and peace. From God, our Father, and the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Anyone enjoy watching The Lone Ranger? You know, The Lone Ranger, The Masked Man, and his trusty sidekick, Tonto. Um, there were still a few reruns on in my day, although nowadays, with all of those hundreds of cable channels and with internet, uh, YouTube, I, you can find it on YouTube, um, and you can watch those if, you, if you're if you missing out on it, and if you're a fan like Dr. Reed Lessing is, uh, you can still hear those famous opening lines, nowhere in those sterling pages of yesteryear can one find a greater champion of justice. We turn again to those thrilling days, when out of the past come the thundering hooves uh, beats of the great horse silver, for the Lone Ranger rides again. hi -o, Silver! And if you, if you, even if you've only watched one or two episodes, you know that in the very end of this show, in the last minute or so, or, or so uh, someone would always ask the question, who was that masked man? Here was someone who had been in the clutches of death, who uh, inches from total annihilation, without a pistol, or in prison, or some sort of pinch or pickle, and the Lone Ranger delivered, saved and rescued them, and they had missed it. Who was that masked man? From their youth, Israel had been called out of Egypt. You, you all know the story of the Exodus, the, the Passover, the crossing of the Red Sea. They had been fed and nourished for the journey and given their tribal inheritance. They had the sure and certain prophetic words of Elijah and Elisha. God had again and again delivered, saved, and rescued them. And through unfaithful living, they missed it. The result was that the Assyrian juggernaut, the rod of God's anger, attacked and destroyed the northern kingdom in 721 BC. <laughs> That's the night the lights went out in Israel. Amos promises that this night of dark he promises this night of darkness in our texts, years before it actually happens. So what sort of day did Israel expect the day of the Lord to be? And especially in light of the fact that they were longing for this day. Well, of course, they were expecting a day of celebration, of of greatness, of, the, of, the, of a king, and uh, victory, and glory. How does Amos confirm or deny their expectations from the verses? Well, he says, this isn't a day that you are longing for. This will be a night. This will be destruction. They aren't walking with the Lord as much as they think they are. This is a uh, this is a couple of weeks ago on Ash Wednesday, we talked about the earthquake. The ground is shaking again. And last week we talked about upside down. Well, Amos is taking the day of the Lord and turning it upside down. 
again for these people who think that they're worshipping God and following him with him. Why does Amos announce that this day will be darkness and not light? Darkness, fear, destruction, darkness, evil. It's not going to be a celebration and good things that they're expecting. Amos warns in verse 19 that Israel's punishment would come just at the moment when they felt most secure. He, sa he says it's as if a ma man ran away from a lion and met a bear, or ran into his house. Oh, your home is one of the most secure places, so you all right, go in, turn on the lights, lock the door, you're safe from everything, all the monsters that lurk outside, right? And then he puts his hand against the wall. Oh, there's a serpent bites you. Some of the worst horror movies are about people who go into their homes, think they're safe, and then they find themselves in, uh, captured in some sort of trouble. This is the night that the Lord has made. So there's two hunters out. Uh, they were squirrel hunting, so they didn't have their big guns with them, just their little squirrel guns, and they came across a bear, <laughs> a big bear. They knew their guns weren't going to be any help, so they dropped their rifles and they go running for cover. And the first man climbs up, climbs a tree, and he gets up, must have been a little tree, small enough that this big bear didn't want to climb it. Uh, while the other man found a, a little cave, a hole in the rock, so he dives in and climbs into there. And the bear, he couldn't climb the tree and he couldn't climb into the, into the cave, so he just sits down in between. He knows he's, when it, somebody's going to have to come down or out sometime. So, uh, for no apparent uh, reason then, um, the man sitting up in the tree is thinking about his good fortune that he didn't get caught. Um, and suddenly he sees his friend Joe come running out of the cave and, and almost ran into the bear. And then he, then he turned around and he went running back into the cave. And then a minute later he comes running back out. And he sees the bear again, he looks around and then he jumps back into the cave. And third time he comes flying out, the, the man up in the tree says, Hey Joe, are you crazy? Stay in the cave till the bear leaves. And Joe's panting and says, I can't, there's, there's another bear in there too. What, what we think is safe is actually a place of doom. This is what Amos says. The night the Lord has made is like a man fleeing from a lion and a bear meets him. Or he goes into the house and leans his hand against the wall. <sighs> the serpent bites him. Oh, well, maybe around here it might be a black widow spider, but uh, in the baptismal flood, you and I were called out of Egypt. In the Eucharistic body and blood, we are fed and nourished for our journey. We have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven, says 1 Peter 1, 4. We have the word of the prophets made certain, 2 Peter 1, 19. God has again and again delivered, saved, and rescued us, and we've missed it. Why? John 3.19 says, This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. We love the darkness of self-centered narcissism. We live in the darkness of lies and half-truths. And we have an ongoing lust for more of the darkness that feeds our flesh. The prince of darkness mocks our feeble discipleship, our failed relationships, and our fatal attractions. 
One of the greatest tragedies would be to live in darkness when we could live in light. That's why we built a giant dam on the river, right? Rose Crawford had been blind for 50 years. She had an operation in an Ontario hospital. She said, I just can't believe it. As the doctor lifted the bandages off of her eyes, she wept when the first, for the first time in her life, dazzling the beautiful world of form and light greeted her eyes and she could see. We live in this all the time. We take it for granted. The amazing Part of this story, however, was that 20 years of her blindness were unnecessary. She didn't know that surgical techniques had been developed and that an operation could have rescued her vision at the age of 30. The doctor said she just figured there was nothing that could be done for her condition. Much of her life could have been completely different. And much of our lives may be different as well. There is no need for us to remain in the darkness of God's judgment. For Jesus, the light that took on flesh, so that he might take us into his arms, heals our hurts, forgives our filth, destroys our darkness. He took on flesh, not to demonstrate the innocence of infancy, but in order to live the life that we could not and die our death, so we need not. Dazzling light, brilliant light, eternal light. No wonder the Nicene Creed declares Jesus the light of light. But the light of the world is also that knows the darkness of the Lord's night. For three hours he hung on the cross in darkness. He bled in the darkness. He cried in the darkness. He thirsted in the darkness. Jesus knows the darkness of the Lord's night better than anyone. Would this thick darkness mean that Jesus ceases to shine again? Would the betrayal, the blood, the burial be the final curtain call? Never! Jesus is the great light. John 1 says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Art Holst was a veteran NFL referee. He tells a story about a Sunday when the Kansas City chief tight end named Fred Arvanis was tackled so hard that his artificial eye popped out on the ground. Soon the, the missing eye was found and Arbanus popped it back in and was eager to resume play. And Holst uh, <laughs> playfully said to Arbanus, I'm, I'm impressed with your courage, but what would you have done if you had lost the other eye? And Arbana snapped back, that's easy. Then I'd have become a referee. While it often seems like referees live in the dark, <laughs> we oftentimes do too. We miss things that happen right in front of us. All that changes when we trust and follow Jesus who leads us to live forever in the light of his love. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.